My name is Andre Jacobs, and I'm the owner and founder of the Knowledge Hub. Welcome to all attendees on today's session. And today's masterclass will deal with ethics and medical schemes. Ethics matter. With your permission, I will now continue with the presentation. You will obtain your certificate after your CTPD certificate after the session and after passing the assessment. The link to the ebook and the copy of the presentation will be emailed to you within two working days. And when you have passed the exam, your certificate will be mailed to you within 72 hours. If you don't pass, you will be given three additional attempts. Please note, all assessments must be completed by the 31st of October. So our agenda is jump-packed with 12 topic areas. This means that in the two hours allowed for this presentation, we will need to be quick and additional information is available in the ebook Ethics and Medical Schemes. It is sad that MediClinic, which is now owned by Remgro and MSC are making headlines, but for the wrong reason. However, in today's presentation, we will focus on a range of stakeholders, medical schemes, gap providers, intermediaries, and uh, medical scheme, um, uh, healthcare providers. All of them impacted by the unfortunate situation that MediClinic finds themselves in. We have learned important lessons from the medical MediClinic, despite whether they are guilty or not. And, and I'm not making a judgment call on, on whether they're guilty, whether the whistleblower is correct, or whether it's just sour grapes. Some people have also said that it's highly unlikely that so many people um, should have been involved to be able to do this, and, and that it is unlikely that it is true. Well, the same was said about state, state capture. The same was said about Stein of Enron or myriad of other corporate failures. So to understand ethics, I want to pause here and I want you to consider these questions yourself. Um, does an ethical behavior pay? For instance, if MediClinic were still listed, what would have happened to the share price? Does ethics change over time? How we saw ethics prior to 94 versus how we see ethics today, did it change? How do you define ethics? Have a look at those questions and, and ponder a bit about them. Ethics is the compass that guides us towards integrity and shapes our character. So at its core, ethics is concerned with questions about how we ought to live our lives, how we ought to treat other people, and what kind of society we would strive to create. It involves examining and evaluating the values and principles that underpin human behavior, and it seeks to develop a set of moral standards that can guide individuals and institutions in their decision making. Ultimately, the goal of ethics is to provide a rational and systematic approach to moral decision making that can help individuals and societies navigate complex ethical dilemmas and conflicts. Ethics provides a framework for evaluating our beliefs, values and actions, and it challenges us to consider the consequences of our choices for ourselves and for others. So when we look at ethics, there are three subfields of ethics. It's a meta-ethics or the understanding where moral values and facts come from. Then it is the normative uh, ethics, 
deals with about deciding what is right and wrong in certain situations. And then the area that we really focus on is um, the applied ethics. So it's the application of the ethical principles to specific issues and the context, such as medical ethics, business ethics, and then also the environmental side of ethics. When we look at the color of ethics, it's not only black and white. There are many gray areas. Values and principles are often open to interpretation. An example is where you prioritize care between two patients due to cost or the stage of life. In these gray areas, it's important to approach the situation with thoughtfulness and awareness of the potential impact on all stakeholders involved. The type of questions we battle with Is it better to spend six million rand saving the life of an 85 year old patient with a range of comorbidities or spending the same money on vaccinating children? The question often is Is it your child or is it your father or mother? What would you decide and what would you use? if you were on that side and you had to make that decision. Behavioral economics is a subfield that applies to psychological insights to economic decision-making. It recognizes that people do not always make rational decisions, but instead are influenced by a variety of cognitive and emotional biases. In the context of ethical dilemmas in health insurance, behavioral economics can help us understand why individuals and organizations make decisions that are not necessarily in line with ethical principles. An ethical business is not always illegal, but it is bad business practice. Let's assume it is true in the case of MediClinic. What does it say about the ethics of the doctors involved? What does it say of the administrator involved with that? Do you feel that you, if you are extremely ill, that you would go and uh, get a very uh, delicate procedure done in a mediclinic? Do you think that they will have your best interest at all? I don't think so. So therefore, the consumer, just reading it in the media, um, have a negative connotation to the business, maybe irrational, maybe the doctor that you would see is ethical, but because he is associated with the organization, one would be cautious about uh, trusting such a doctor with a delicate procedure. And therefore, less business, less profits for the shareholders, bad business practice. And even just insinuation that it is wrong um, or that there is an ethical business can lead to people perceiving the business in a negative way. But their licenses can be suspended, penalties can be imposed, they will have reputational damage and a loss of customer trust, as I have explained. <laughs> We sometimes use ethics, morals, values, trustworthiness, and integrity as meaning the same thing. We can say that 
part of the same family, but they actually mean different things. So let's unpack some of these concepts. New success is not measured by wealth or status, but by the integrity of your actions. Ethics refer to a broader system of principles and values that guide the behavior of individuals and organizations in a particular field or profession. Ethics reflect the values that guide behavior of groups and individuals. Morals refer to a set of principles or values that guide an individual's behavior or action. Some morals may be universal, such as respecting the property of others, loving your family, being fair, or being brave. Values, on the other hand, are personal beliefs or principles that individuals hold. Knowing your personal values can answer the following questions for you. Should I be firm in my position or compromise on a position? Should I accept promotion offered to me? What type of job should I pursue? Should I follow the traditional path or make a new path? That's your values. Trustworthiness refers to the quality or character of being reliable, dependable, and worthy of the trust of others. Trustworthiness is built on consistent behavior, integrity, transparency, and fulfilling commitments and promises. Integrity is a personal characteristic or virtue that reflects an individual's adherence to ethical principles and moral values. It's a quality of being honest, trustworthy, and having strong moral principles. So, did you spot that with integrity, we combine morals and values as meaning the same and linking it to ethics? We can confidently say that a person without integrity would lack the values and morals that individuals in society aspire to or associate with, and therefore the ethics will be questioned by society. Integrity is the foundation on which trust is built, and trust is a currency of meaningful relationships. So when we speak about ethics and organizational risk, I want you to have in your mind also the mediclinic debacle that I have referred to. In today's complex and interconnected business landscape, organizations face a myriad of risks that can impact their reputation, financial stability, and long-term success. Ethics risk is, the, is a crucial, but often overlooked dimension of organizational risk. So why are ethics risk important? Well, it impacts our reputation. There's legal and regulatory compliance, employee morale and retention, and stakeholder relationships. So let's unpack it looking at, at MediClinic. Yes, they have a reputational impact. Um, there's no debate about that. There legal and regulatory consequences on that. So, so the hospital association haven't to date um, entered the fray of, of that, but uh, surely the, the medical schemes um, as stakeholders have, have um, reacted. Council for Medical Schemes um, gave an opinion about 
um, how long it would be. Uh, and employees within MediClinic are now looking inward. They're looking at how can I protect myself? That's natural to do in a situation like that. So in that regard, it is not a good position that an organization want to find them in. They want the employees to be engaged. They want the employees to be customer focused. Um, they want the employees to uh, remain employed by the organization and not seek other opportunities. And some employees might say, if that is how my employer is acting, I don't want to be part of this um, and would look, uh, would look for employment elsewhere. So ethics risk is an important aspect, often overlooked by organizations. So how you manage it is, is really establishing ethical governance structures, cultivating an ethical culture, uh, ethics training and awareness, robust compliance programs, and reporting on investigation mechanisms. Were this adequately done in a medical, uh, mediclinic um, case? I doubt it. I will tell. Now, when we look at ethics and, and King or the King reports and PCF, um, we will try and draw practical examples uh, from the King report and, and TCF and make sure that our business are properly aligned uh, to these reports. Our actions are the reflection of our ethics and they have the power to shape a better world. Well, so when we look at King 3, it spoke about ethical leadership, that that's where it starts, that we need to engage our stakeholders, that we need to manage the risk, we need to look at compliance, and we need to have integrated and that silo reporting. King 4 addresses the same points primarily as King 3. However, King 4 adds a more inclusive governance layer on top of the focus area. Governance is a system or rules, the practices and processes by which a company is directed or controlled. So King 4 added the substance to the form that was created by King 3. Differently put, King 4 adds the so what to the reporting. So let's look at, after this, at, at 10 action steps that businesses can take to align their business to, King, to the King reports. But before we do that, just think of what Judge Zondo recommended on state capture. Think of any state-owned enterprise, or think of Enron or Steinlein, or any clinic, and think of what went wrong. The purpose of the next slide is to provide a roadmap to prevent corporate failures to happen. So those 10 steps are establish an ethical culture, develop a code of conduct, ensure that your board composition is independent, and that was definitely a concern in the case of the Steinoff um, uh, debacle, uh, engage your stakeholders uh, meaningfully, uh, manage your risk and manage the ethical risk, ensure that you have integrated reporting, compliance and regulatory adherence, uh, responsible remuneration practices, uh, looking at the impact of the remuneration policies um, on all levels in your organization, data privacy and security, 
and in continuous improvement. So when we think of any state and enterprises, Enron, Steinhoff, or many clinic, and apply these 10 steps, we stand a far better chance acting ethically. However, we are on the financial services field. Does ethical mean, behavior mean that we treat our clients fairly? It should, but what action steps can we do to ensure that we comply with the TCF, TCF principles? The, not the letter of the, of the law. Uh, it's not a law TCF, but not a letter of it. Not, not what is the words, uh, but what is meant by the words treating customers with the emphasis on fairly. So I think there's five steps that we can do. Is, is really be customer-centric putting us in the shoes of the customer, putting the glasses on of the customer. To be clear and transparent in our communication, to provide suitable advice. I always look at a promise that the Financial Planning Institute uh, provide, where they say, I will give to people the advice that I would give to myself in the same circumstances. Fairness in our pricing and our charges. And ensure that we are serious about complaints handling and dispute resolution. And when there is a dispute or a complaint against our business, to clean house. And I'm not talking about being vindictive to, to people that transgressed, but to clean house, to look at our policies again, revamp our policies and making sure that it doesn't happen uh, again. We may think also that action step four only applies to brokers that charge professional fees. That's understandable, but it also applies to brokers using normal commission and the services that we render as an intermediary for them. So this section focuses on the ethical organizational culture that can be created or improved. A true legacy we leave behind is not measured by our achievements, but by the ethical impact we have on others. Organizational culture encompasses shared beliefs, norms and practices that guide employee interaction and influence overall performance. So the requirements for a strong organizational character would be clarity of purpose, consistency and alignment, employee involvement, trust and transparency, continuous learning and adaption. Key considerations to create a strong organizational culture would be the leadership role, cultural diversity and inclusion of different views, change management, and the alignment with the strategy. So if we want 10 building blocks that we can use to, to create a strong organizational culture, We need to have clear ethical standards, ethical leadership, employee engagement, comprehensive policies. We need to focus on ethical training and education, protecting the whistleblowers, not assassinating them like in uh, uh, 
de, de, de Krimbaatkrant werk thuis, uh, reward and recognition, uh, transparent communication, ethical decision making processes, and continuous evaluation and improvement. Now, do I have your permission? I think I have to refer to corporate failures I have mentioned before, Enron, Eskom, Steinhoff, or even MediClinic, and ask if these 10 steps were followed. And if specifically step two were applied, would we have had the same corporate failures we experience? We should all agree that it would have been avoided. Let us look closer. to home, to analyze the digital vibes debacle, the liquidation of Constantia Health, a Constantia Oil Squid, or MediClinic. Very topical is our NHI bill, and which, and which of the safeguards do you see in the bill? Which of these 10 safeguards you see in the world? Sadly, very sadly, I've not seen anyone of these 10 building blocks in the proposed amended NHI bill. I've seen not one of these 10 building blocks in that well, sadly so. It tells us what we can expect going forward, not because of a specific person that would manage the NHI bond or the NHI fund, or a specific political party that will be there. This is not a political statement. This is an ethical statement. It's an ethical culture statement. In the NHI bill, these safeguards are not there. And because these safeguards are not there, therefore, it is easy for any person in future to transgress and to act unethical. Because we have distrust in human beings, but because the structure, the framework, the foundation for ethical behavior is lacking. And therefore, we can expect possible failures. It can be prevented. We can prevent these failures by putting in place the correct framework. This is an interesting topic because in every organization, we have three or four generations employed. And the question that we ask ourselves, do we all see ethics the same? I would believe, wanted to believe that it is so, but sadly it's not. And that makes this topic of ethics in organizations so much more interesting. In the face of adversity, ethics 
is un the unwavering principle that keeps us grounded and resilient. So let's look at the baby boomers. Now that's the people born between 1946 and 1964. They tend to value personal relations, uh, responsibility, hard work, respect for authority. In my view, ethical behavior is following established rules and standards, which may be more likely to trust institutions that have been a, around for a long time. Now, when we look at that, and I fall into that category uh, of, of baby, baby boomers, I'm sort of on the edge of baby boomers and, and generation X. But we would say that we are the wise people. Uh, but are we correct? Eskimo has been gone with us for long. So has been Mediclinic. So has been Constantia. So in terms of that, we as old people, we as um, uh, the wise side of the population, we would want to believe that, uh, are sometimes wrong in our behavior of respecting authority, uh, trusting institutions that have been uh, with us for, for many years. So sometimes um, we need to have some introspection. But let's look at Generation X. Now that's a people born 1965 to 1980. They tend to value independence, self-reliance, uh, and a work-life balance. They may view ethical behavior as being honest and transparent, and may be more likely to question authority and established institutions. So yeah, the people will take it to task. Yeah, they will say, <laughs> yeah, Eskimo has been with us for many years, but look at X, Y, Z. They will want to stand the ground. And they see that as, as being the correct behavior. The millennials, 1981 to 96, view ethical behavior as taking responsibility for one's actions. And they may be more likely to prioritize ethical considerations over profitability. Now, a certain organization where uh, one generation maybe started or founded the organization, and you have a large pool of millennials that ask you a question about profitability and ethical considerations. Take again the Mediclinic debacle. What is the debacle about? The debacle is about profitability. The debacle is about the question that, or the practice that is alleged, where accounts were adjusted so that higher profitability can be achieved. What do you think? Millennials think about that. Well, that resonates well with millennials. And then we sit with Generation Z. They made their ethical behavior as being inclusive and socially responsible. And they may be more likely to use social media to hold companies accountable for their actions. Generation Z will sometimes look at things like your carbon footprint as a reason for classifying your organization as being ethical or not. Maybe something that is not part of your normal makeup of how you do business. 
it's not part of it's not your business it's not what you do but they will criticize that as either being ethical or not and we have to take that into consideration so who is the responsibility is ethics think about it and I can show you only one picture to express or to explain that but still think about it ethics is not an abstract concept it's practical embodiment of our core values so whose responsibility is ethics do me a favor choose one of these entities which you believe is the most responsible for ethics and whilst they're on the screen point your finger to them how many fingers point back at you yes it's correct what can I do you might ask I don't have the answer to this but as mentioned before I can only show you one picture that answers this question yes you're correct Mahatma Gandhi and Mother Teresa were normal people like me and you and they made a huge impact nothing is stopping us from making a difference in ethical behavior true ethicality requires courage the courage to stand up for what is right even in the face of opposition so up now we have looked at understanding ethics and some words associated with ethics therefore we looked at ethics risk and organizational risk we looked at tcf and the king reports and organizational culture we have learned that generations see ethics differently and that we can all make a difference the question that there must be is whether there are empirical evidence that there is a business case for ethics ethics is not a constraint on innovation it is a catalyst for responsible and sustainable progress so think about mediclinic or any one of the other corporate failures and think how ethics impact their business it impacts their reputation the risk management, employee engagement, innovation, long term sustainability, customer loyalty, competitive advantage. It impacts future sales, improve relationships of existing relationships, suppliers, and partners. And as I also mentioned before, employer retention. So the correlation between ethical behavior and financial performances clearly indicate in this slide the Institute of Business Ethics 
found that capital uh, employed or the return on capital employed for companies with a strong ethical culture was 9,18% compared to 4,93% for those who found surely ethical business makes financial sense. Harvard Business Review said that there's 4.8% higher return on assets with companies with ethical culture. And there is some young report found that companies that prioritize sustainable and ethical behavior tend to have higher valuations and lower risk profiles. 5.4% better than their peers. Ethical behavior bias. The next few sections list the ethical dilemmas for medical schemes, health insurers, doctors, and brokers. Ethics is a moral fabric that weaves together honesty, fairness, and accountability. Health insurers face dilemmas of coverage denials, premium increases, networks and providers, uh, how wide they are, how much are we going to remunerate them, um, a myriad of integrate and complex questions relating to the providers and the quality of service and confidentiality. When we look at the ethical challenges for healthcare providers, it's obviously patient advocacy, insurance restrictions, insurance denials, time constraints, and a conflict of financial interest. When we look at this slide, the practical oath of doctors are firstly doing no harm. My conflict with their financial needs, therefore their family. When doctors negotiate medical with medical schemes and insurers, or in national health policy discussions, they, without fear of contradiction, resist restrictions and denial of cover, and motivated in terms of their patient advocacy role, the critical oath. So, and, and this plays a huge burden on doctors. They want to care for their patients, but they also have to care for their family, which is, in a certain sense, conflicting in nature and creates an ethical dilemma to them. So for the policyholders, it's what access do I have? Is it fair? Is it transparent? Can I actually uh, understand uh, my rights and obligations? Is my privacy protected? And is the treatment that I receive uh, professional? But do I also act as a policyholder professional? When it, you're on a, let's say, a traditional medical scheme, and there's still benefits left at the end of the year, do you, as a policyholder, make sure that you utilize all those services so that you don't lose them? Is that ethical? Or will you argue? that, yes, you've paid for it, so therefore you should use it. When we look at home and we look at the ethical challenges for brokers, this section focuses on that, and then we'll move into practical steps of how to create the ethical uh, broker reach and uh, also support existing brokers 
that already act ethically because the vast majority of intermediaries are doing their business in an ethical and transparent manner. Ethics is not a trend to follow. It is an unwavering commitment to doing what is right, regardless of the circumstances. We know one is conflicts of interest, the conflict of interest between the provider, the funder, ethical scheme and the client's interest, transparency, suitability of advice, and remember the FBI promise that I refer to, if to somebody the same advice that you would give to yourself in the same circumstances privacy, and our professional conduct. You will see I, in the dilemma, I don't put certain things of the FACE Act in that. But if you avoid conflicts of interest, if you are transparent, if your advice is suitable, if you protect the privacy of uh, the clients, clients and you act professional, one act is professional, then you have complied with the spirit of the FACE Act. So in this section, and it's a very interesting section this, We need to focus on what is within our control. We need to look at what is in our control and what are the things that we can do and focus on that is in our control to serve our clients ethically. There's certain things that is out of our control. Let's not dwell on them. Let's not focus on them. The strength of our ethics is revealed in how we treat others, especially when no one is watching. So what can't I control? Regulation. The government wants to implement certain regulations. It's outside our control. Economic climate. The lack of accountability in state-owned enterprises natural disasters, access, uh, prevention, people that don't care about the health care, um, fraudulent acts. Could any of us prevent the debacle that happened in Enra or in Medi Clinic or in Health Square? The asymmetry of information. Is it really in our control? I would tell you that it is not. And that we shouldn't dwell on that. But what we can do is we can make sure that our advertising is accurate. We can provide accurate information. We can make sure that our decision making is ethical. We can make sure that we treat our customers fairly. I should not dwell on whether you treat your customers fairly, but my customers, I must treat fairly. Transparency about fees and services should be at the forefront of my practice. I need to follow ethical standards. I need to respect my client decisions. I need to explain the coverage and the exclusions. I need to protect confidentiality of my client. And I should avoid conflict of interest regarding me 
and my practice. I can't avoid your conflict of interest. And I should not be concerned about that. But I should be concerned about my own conflict of interest and make sure that that doesn't impact the decision making that I have. So to provide accurate and truthful information, I put to you these five steps. So for all 10 of the things within our control, I have provided you with five action steps. So conduct through research, the information provided, uh, the clients is accurate and up to date, be transparent about the limitations, written documentation, regularly review it, and encourage clients to ask questions. When I ask questions, it's an opportunity to ensure that your information is accurate and truthful and also impactful. When we look at uh, the conflicts of interest in insurance providers, disclose any relationships with new providers, develop clear processes for evaluating different insurance providers, establish guidelines for compensation and financial arrangements, encourage clients to shop around and compare, uh, compare different insurance. Now you want that one, and, and I don't say insure, uh, encourage them to go and look somewhere else, uh, to another broker. I mean, that would be bad business practice and, and, and it wouldn't be practical to suggest that. But get your client to evaluate their portfolios on an annual basis. They may be locked in with a specific provider. Is that appropriate for them? Still, is there not some new kids on the block that may add value to them? And um, so, so, so that's the steps that you can take to avoid the conflicts of interest. To treating customers fairly, we need to create policies that uh, applies to all the clients. We need to provide them resources on information in, in different languages where we can. Um, there's one specific brokerage that I know communicate uh, with its clients in, 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 in their specific language. Um, uh, and then they've taken the, the brochures of providers and uh, policy documents and all that and translated that at huge expense so that I can actually make sure that I communicate with the clients in their language of choice. Again, review the access and the feedback and encourage diversity and inclusion in organizations. Develop and implement strict policies and procedures to handling and storing client data. Confidentiality is key. Obtain explicit consent before sharing information. Regularly review and update data security protocols. Make sure that your staff are trained and see who else as a third party specialize in this area that can assist and guide you. Clearly disclose fees and compensation. Provide written documents, plans outlining the details of all the fees and what services they can expect. Review your fee schedule and your services and compensation. Encourage clients to ask questions and consider offering fee for service or at alternative compensation models. Practical steps that you can take. Apply to your business where you can. Listen actively. 
provide clients with clear and unbiased information about their options. Respect and support clients right to make informed decisions. Avoid imposing personal opinions or biases on clients. And continue to communicate with clients. Clearly explain the limitations and exclusions. Provide a written documentation to the clients, encourage clients to ask questions, elaborate with clients, and review it. You see that it gets there the whole time. The same steps are there. Encourage clients to ask questions, elaborate and explore alternative solutions, regularly update. All these steps have got those three um, steps in them built into them. And by doing that, you will ensure that all your actions that are within your control are always correct. Familiarize oneself with the ethical standards and codes of conduct. Integrate the ethical standards into everyday practice, seeking ongoing professional development and, and opportunities. Again, reflect and engage in dialogue with peers and colleagues to ensure that your business remains ethical. Conduct through the research on different medical scheme plans and providers that information provided to clients is accurate and up-to-date. Be transparent about any limitations and exclusions. Provide written documentation, regularly review and update information, and encourage clients to ask questions. Ensure that all marketing material and communication is accurate and represent the features and the benefits and exclusions as we mentioned. Provide transparent and complete information. Avoid using misleading language or false claims or exaggerations and to attract the clients and clearly disclose any affiliations, financial incentives or conflicts of interest and review your marketing practices regularly. Regularly reflect on personal values, ethical principles. Seek feedback from clients and peers to identify areas of improvement. Engage in ongoing professional development activities. Stay updated on industry trends and foster a culture of ethical behavior. So if you want to find more information, you can go to medicalschemesexplained.co.za. You can follow the Facebook uh, group, Medical Schemes Explained, or you can send me a mail at andre at medicalschemesexplained.co.za. You can also send me a WhatsApp on 084-250-1147. hope that this was informative, and I wish you well with the assessment. Uh, for this um, CPD session. Be blessed and thank you for listening to me.